to our, our seminar on uh, economic and social convergence in the EU, making it happen, exclamation mark. Uh, my name is Donald Storey. I'm the chief researcher at uh, Eurofound and I'll be dis uh, chairing all the discussions today. This, as uh, I hope you understand, is a joint uh, event uh, between Eurofound, which is the European Foundation for the Improvement of Living and Working Conditions. That's why we have the abbreviation Eurofound. Uh, and uh, DG ECFIN. And we'd like to thank uh, very much uh, ECFIN, in particular uh, Director uh, Mary Veronica Tovsak Pletersky for an excellent uh, cooperation in this. Uh, before we begin, just to remind you that uh, this has been webcast live and later the afternoon uh, on demand uh, it can be viewed on Eurofound's uh, website. Of course, uh, uh, during the seminar we'll be active on social media and I invite, etc, etc, you all to engage uh, in that. Uh, you have a conference pack uh, which uh, includes, among other things, uh, Eurofound's latest uh, work on convergence, upward convergence in employment and socio-economic factors. This is one of many um, uh, reports that we've been doing uh, on convergence and many more to come. We're taking a very, very broad uh, scope of uh, indicators, uh, working conditions, living conditions, employment and social uh, protection, etc., etc., and looking at the convergence tendencies uh, of that. Uh, also, just to remind you, there's a feedback form in the pack. Uh, please, I know it's a bit of a drag sometimes to fill it in, but we really do appreciate uh, any feedback that we can uh, get uh, for you. Uh, it's a packed morning uh, ahead, a lot of very good speakers, very good discussants. Uh, and uh, first of all, we're going to be looking at uh, economic convergence, largely run that part then by ECFIN, and then uh, upward social convergence, uh, which Eurofound and others uh, will be speaking about. After these initial sessions, uh, we are very pleased that we have uh, Dragos uh, uh, Pislaru, uh, MEP, uh, who is eminently uh, well positioned to uh, give a perspective from the European Parliament, and we appreciate very much and uh, looking forward to your contribution. Coffee bar, you can read the programme. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the last panel session, we'll hear from a, uh, a broader um, uh, input from uh, the Commission uh, and uh, the social partners, and above all, uh, then, and also uh, you know, during the other two uh, sessions, we really welcome and encourage uh, contributions uh, from the floor. Uh, and then finally, uh, Eurofound's director, who should be arriving uh, shortly, uh, will uh, close the seminar. Uh, I would like now to uh, pass the floor to uh, Mary Veronica tovsak Pletersky. Again, thank you very much for your great cooperation. And uh, Marie Veronica uh, will uh, open uh, the seminar for us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Donald. Let me say, first of all, that this is a special uh, uh, honor and pleasure to organize uh, this event jointly with you and your team, because I think it's uh, also showing how much we should work together to understand better the convergence uh, as such from all perspectives. And this is certainly, I think, uh, a nice illustration that on our sides uh, we, we try to do uh, that uh, mm, uh, mm, concretely. So uh, let me also join uh, welcoming words uh, uh, from our side. And I'm very happy that the interest for this uh, discussion and the conference uh, is uh, so high that I I'm also able to um, welcome the web streaming uh, community that I hope is also be able to follow our discussions this morning. Uh, I would start by saying that this uh, is a very topical issue at the present juncture. Uh, you would remember, and many of you know also, many of you also know that uh, Europe was tagged by some as a convergence machine. So this is something uh, which was very clearly, you know, uh, the feature that we were proud of. However, the economic and financial crisis has disrupted the process of convergence that European countries enjoyed in the past. The crisis brought about, I would say, roughly speaking, two insights. The first one, that economic convergence hinges on more than just GDP growth. 
and it is also something that requires a sustainable, well, a sustainable economic structures. Secondly, what we have learned is also that economic convergence is necessary, but certainly not a sufficient condition for convergence of social outcomes. So these are, of course, I mean, we, lot, we learned much more from the crisis, but just to maybe summarize what I think is particularly you know, important for our discussions this morning. Now, uh, I would like to say also that these realities are also now reflected in the priorities of the upcoming commission and the political guidelines of the president-elect. Uh, she spoke about the fact that as Europeans, we should rediscover our unity and our strength. It is true that being together also means prioritizing fairness and creating opportunities for everybody. In other words, as our president-elect said, create an economy that works for people. We need economic development that is both, I would say, inclusive and sustainable. Economic and social convergence should be a key product of economic integration, and it is certainly an aspiration of citizens of Europe. Ultimately, nations join the EU and commit to align policies in an effort to improve their well-being including in terms of social fairness and welfare. This upward convergence is the political goal that, was, that we cannot afford to miss. Political and economic support for the common European project and the road to deeper integration depend on achieving this goal. And we know that Working together is the best way to address these challenges of modern economy, like digital transformation, transformation of energy and climate, and also trade disruptions that we are facing more and more in today's world. Economic convergence is mainly the process of catching up in terms of GDP per capita. Sadly, we have seen little evidence of it in the so-called middle-income trap countries, those that joined the EU before 2004 and had relatively low level of economic development at their accession date. They were expected to grow faster than they actually did. Regional disparities also appeared. These problems are related to the way the economies of these countries were structured with relatively less productive sectors claiming the biggest share of cross-border capital in the run-up to the crisis. That is why I would like to stress this, policies should be designed in such a way that imbalances do not build up and crises have less adverse consequences. Economic policies that make labor and product market more resilient and economic adjustment less painful and faster contributes to economic convergence. The real challenge is to build up political support for reforms by designing them in a way that makes their outcomes inclusive. And this we have seen is really still the challenge that I'm looking forward also to discuss, and you know, especially with those of you in the room that have experience uh, in this. That is the reason why we are today paying particular attention not only to the economic convergence, but also convergence of social outcomes. For example, convergence of living and working conditions. We all know that economic prosperity has been measured by the GDP per capita for a long time, and there are, I would still say, good reasons for that. Yet, it should be acknowledged that an ordinary citizen 
may not agree that there is satisfactory level of economic development should it not translate into a dignified level of personal and professional life. Therefore, the problems of inequality, social injustice, and people left behind are naturally part of the convergence topic. I'm very glad that we are going to have these complementary viewpoints, as I already said, on the importance and developments of economic and social convergence coming together at this conference this morning. In the presentations that were already presented by Donald, I think we will have a possibility to deep dive in the uh, analytical perspective and also trying to understand the challenges in the policy making. But certainly we are also very happy that a number of you from the European Parliament, the European, uh, the European associations of uh, workers and uh, businesses were able to join us in our discussion this morning. So I will leave it there and uh, I'm really truly looking forward for our discussions this morning. I also hope that this is not the last event in this composition. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, bang on time. Uh, that's excellent. Uh, I would invite uh, then uh, Plamen uh, Nikolov, uh, who is um, economic analysis at uh, DG ECFIN, and uh, Sanzana Alcidi, uh, who is uh, head of the economic policy unit in SEPS. And uh, Plamen will uh, give us a, a presentation on uh, convergence, quite a general one. Uh, I must say I had a quick uh, glance at the, the slides, of course, in advance, and I think I've seldom seen such a clear, concise, uh, coherent uh, presentation uh, of uh, these uh, economic issues. And after that, uh, so 20, 25 minutes, something like that, uh, uh, since Anna will have uh, an opportunity to discuss, and uh, perhaps we can all uh, engage in such a discussion as well. The floor is yours, please. Oh. Thank you, Donald. Uh, let me first my, express my gratitude of being invited here and uh, being able to present this uh, work that the European Commission is doing on this uh, very important topic. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that with Massimiliano we already had a lot of interaction in, in Brussels and uh, we are happy that uh, you, you guys came here and uh, you had this initiative to organize together this event and to <coughs> To, to present the, the two aspects of convergence, economic on one hand and social on the other hand. Uh, this is, I think, a very important topic. And uh, I'm also looking forward to hearing the views of the panelists and of all of you later on in discussion and in comments. So first, let me start with uh, presenting a few basic ideas and messages that I would like to, to convey to you when we talk about uh, convergence. First, uh, I must say that progress in upward convergence is evident in the EU28, yet it was likely disrupted by the, the forces that made the crisis uh, worse in Europe and the crisis recovery longer. Um, at the same time, I think that structural reforms can make economies more resilient and more adjustable uh, after crisis. And, uh, at the same time, they can stimulate in this respect convergence. I would like to, to convey this message of the importance of structural reforms. Uh, finally, I would like to say that there are ways to build political support for reforms because we all know that uh, this side of the economic policy mix has uh, taken a lot of criticism at, uh, from different sides. and. Uh, and political support, of course, for every, every economic policy is important, but it is particularly important for, for structural reforms. Now, uh, this is a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. First, I will start by stressing the importance of convergence in the EU and talking a bit about the concept of convergence. Uh, then I will show some metrics on how convergence has performed in the EU in uh, recent years. Um, I will follow then with uh, stressing the tools, the policy tools at the EU level, at the national level uh, that are important for, for the, for, to support and to promote convergence. And finally, I will conclude with the role of, of policy, structural reforms to, to boosting convergence. So now starting with the concept and the importance of, of convergence in the monetary union in the EU as well. 
Um, I would like to, to, to emphasize here that we are, we are observing uh, uh, evolution of the notion of convergence, that the focus of, of the convergence topic has shifted gradually towards convergence of outcomes, of, uh, of, of something that is more tangible, let's say, for the ordinary citizens, for all of us. Uh, we started, the, the monetary union was started as, a, as, a, as something that requires nominal convergence, convergence of interest rates, of inflation, of uh, fixing exchange rates, of, of, of converging fiscal policy, in a way. Uh, but then, uh, of course, uh, together with, the, with this uh, nominal convergence, as it is called, and together with synchronization of economic cycles that help uh, monetary policy be more efficient in all parts of, of the monetary union, uh, already from the beginning, the notion of real convergence or, or catching up in terms of, of um, wealth, in terms of well-being as well, in terms of uh, economic development that we call real convergence, and we measure usually by GDP per capita, uh, was already there in the, in the very beginning. It was something that actually nominal convergence was expected to help achieve. Uh, just because we could eliminate um, the cost of exchanging money when we cross a, cross a European border, or, or, the, or the, uh, the, the price transparency that the common currency gives us. That was supposed to build efficiency in our economies and to, to, to build prosperity for everybody. Um, sadly, during the crisis, we saw that this is not automatically the case. Because of imbalances that had built up in, in some countries in the monetary union, when the exchange rates were fixed and when inflation rates converged, and when capital flows uh, uh, were flowing into, into, into these countries, they were not put into productive use or not as much productive as it could have been. And when the crisis, crisis hit, it was very difficult for some countries to adjust their economies to, to foreign demand because domestic demand in Europe collapsed with the, with the financial crisis and the crisis of confidence and uncertainty that the crisis brought. While recovery was much stronger, much more robust abroad, of course, then uh, selling goods and providing services to foreigners could have helped. But, but uh, rigidities in the economies, uh, an, an inability to adjust or, or lack of incentives to adjust actually prevented this type of convergence to adjustable and resilient economic structures and the crisis actually took longer to, to be recovered from and the, the crisis impact was actually deeper. Eventually, of course, what matters for, for people, what matters for all of us is favorable social outcomes. So life, both personal and professional, that conforms to, to a certain level of dignity and a certain level of, uh, uh, of um, well-being for all of us. And, that's how the notion of convergence, starting from this convergence of nominal variables as a prerequisite for the EMU, going through the uh, real convergence in terms of, of, of uh, um, wealth in the countries, and then to adjustable econo economies and adjustable structures of the economies actually evolves into something that is more tangible for the people, and that is actually the social outcomes. And this is basically this shift of paradigm, and this is one of the reasons why we are here today. Um, now, why is convergence important in the EU? It is because actually a converging economic performance is one that actually ensures sustainability of growth. It ensures inclusiveness of growth and cohesion also at regional level. So not only between countries, but within countries and also ensures resilience to shocks, meaning that shocks uh, take less time to, to adjust uh, from, and also uh, uh, lower vulnerability to shocks. Eventually, of course, convergence ensures better functioning of some common policies. In the end, economic integration goals that are achieving prosperity for all citizens through the internal market, for example, through our competitive uh, 
economies, through, through sustainability, through our social, social progress. This is achieved also with the help of, of conversions, with, with the help of territorial cohesion, for example. And that is why uh, it is important for, for, for the member states to strive to achieve convergence. In the end, uh, countries that accede to the EU and they, they join the euro area because they would like to succeed economically and bring prosperity to their, to their citizens. And in order to do so, they have to rely on, on converging factors and to, to, to use the support that convergence can give them. Now, uh, let me switch to, 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 to showing you some metrics and some illustrations of how, how convergence has performed in the, in the EU. Well, starting with the prerequisite for the monetary area, here you have for the euro, for the euro area the convergence of these nominal variables that are measured in the convergence reports of the countries that would like to accede to the, to the monetary union, and they were measured to all of the founding members of the EMU back in in the mid-90s. And uh, we could see here with the dashed lines that in recent times, that the distance between them has decreased. And that is, of course, good. We, we would like to see this, uh, these developments. But at the same time, we have certain peaks that the dashed lines represent min and max, uh, minimum and maximum uh, values for these variables across the 19 countries. We see some, uh, some peaks and some troughs, of course, during the crisis. Uh, but by and large, the average for the euro area, which is with dark blue, is very close to the yellow line, which is the policy rule. Uh, with a certain exception of, of, of indebtedness of the government sector. Of course, it's not only the government sector that is indebted in some countries, but here, of course, in terms of the better functioning of the monetary union, a lot can be done. Uh, let me now go to the, to, the, to the other concept of real convergence, which is actually convergence in terms of GDP per capita. And what we have here is a scatter plot, basically, that is trying to show the relationship between initial wealth, let's say, in terms of GDP per capita, together with the, the progress in changing or in improving this, this position, improving GDP per capita. And what we would like to see is a negative relationship. Countries that were actually having lower GDP per capita initially should grow faster so that they can catch up and, and achieve this upward convergence. Well, indeed, we do see such a relationship when we look at the EU28 as a whole, all of the countries. But much of it is actually due to the countries that are in light blue, the countries that joined the EU after 2004. When we exclude them, when we only have the relationship between the countries that were already members of the EU in 2004, we actually see a positive relationship. The dark blue dashed fitting line is actually upward sloping. And so this represents the fact that actually countries that were relatively poor initially were growing slower. They were not converging, they were rather diverging. And this is a very alarming sign that we, of course, knew for, for quite some time. And we, we do call this a middle income trap. These countries were not the poorest of the whole EU28. They were somewhere in the middle in terms of, of income per capita. But they were stuck there for the years just before in the crisis, in the recovery. They could not really grow as fast as those that exceeded later, and we, we, we would like to know why is, why is that. So in order to answer this question, I was trying to look at, at sectoral level. I was trying to look at the different economic sectors, uh, manufacturing, services, agriculture, public sector. And so what I did is I, I took uh, growth in these in this sectors, and I have around 60 sectors, I took growth, long-term growth in these sectors, which is for, um, for the period, let's say, around 20 years, so spanning the cycle of, of, of booms and busts, like a really long, long period. And I ordered these sectors in terms of highest growing to lowest growing, the average growth during this period. And what I have on top, the, the, the sectors that are growing fast are sectors that are there because of the change of the structure of our economies. For example, we have 
much more importance of computers and digital technology in our lives. So naturally, sectors that rely or produce them are growing quite fast in the last 20, 25 years. At the same time, we have in Western Europe or, or even in Eastern Europe, aging populations. We have life expectancy that is increasing. Naturally, the pharmaceutical sector is growing. I and mean, it's obviously that demand for these products is increasing with aging. And so sectors like telecommunications, different services sector like employment activities, consultancy, these are the sectors that have grown the most in these in this 20 years. Another sector that is growing also quite robustly is water transport because of globalization. All this trade that we do with emerging markets far away, it's done by big container ships. And, and this, is, this is a sector that has grown quite well. Of course, there were booms and busts in, in the sector with the crisis, but overall, over the long time period, this is a sector that has grown well. So then I tried to plot on the left-hand side the relationship between growth in these sectors in each country and growth of GDP per capita, which is basically our convergence metrics, the thing that we would like to, to achieve in order to have real convergence. And I see that the relationship between the two is quite, quite good and it's quite, I would say, it's positive relationship. So in these countries where these sectors grew very robustly and very well, also GDP per capita grew. And so they were converging. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out why is the case that we have middle income countries. And on the right hand side, you see the share of these dynamic sectors, sectors that are growing fast in all the countries that are in the EU, um, or almost all of them that I could have data, um, is actually showing in, in light blue that the countries that need to catch up, these are the countries that are relatively lower on the GDP per capita ranking, are actually, these sectors are not as important as in the others. And so it turns out that in, in, in the countries that are stuck in the middle income trap, the importance of these dynamic sectors is relatively lower and they're unable to catch up. They're unable to, to concentrate in industries that have been growing recently. Well, you have some exceptions, for example, Hungary, which is well above the average in terms of the share of these dynamic sectors. And uh, others, let's say Czechia, I see, for example, here. But countries like Greece, Portugal, uh, for example, Spain, although Spain is a, li a little above average in terms of GDP per capita. These are countries that don't specialize, have not specialized in these sectors, and consequently have not grown as fast as they could have grown. Now, uh, talking about growth, I decided to, uh, to see in the recovery period, so this is basically after 2014 in Europe, how growth in each, in each country has correlated with different, uh, with different metrics. So here I have a cross-country correlation between GDP growth in the recovery period and, and certain indicators. And what we see on the left-hand side with these higher bars is a higher correlation, higher positive correlation, is actually that productivity, that industrial production, export as a share of GDP, these all structural variables, variables that are determined by the structure of the economy, by the ability of the economy to produce and to, to, to produce for own citizens and for foreigners as well, to meet foreign demand. These are very well correlated positively with growth. And so, of course, this is, this is not really causality here, but we have an association. Countries that grew faster, converge better, are ones that also showed good productivity developments, uh, that also showed good industrial production developments, that actually captured more of, of, uh, of export market share. On the other hand, at the extreme right, you have a negative relationship between indebtedness. I, here I have government debt as a percent of GDP. Indebtedness and growth. So, Countries that are burdened with high debt tend to grow slower. And so I wanted to see how our convergence developments in some of these, uh, these variables developing over time in Europe. So what is the cross-country dispersion, the, the, the difference across the EU in terms of these, of these different uh, variables? And so I start here with uh, 
convergence in, in terms of structural indicators. And basically what these lines show is the cross-country disparity. So the lower the line, the less disparity you have between the EU members and the more convergence you have. So as you see, for all of these uh, different metrics, uh, which are productivity, investment rate, uh, industrial production, export market share, all of them are actually declining in risk, the disparity, I mean, between countries is declining. So this is, of course, a welcoming sign. So countries are becoming more equal, in a sense, in this respect. But of course, we also want to know, are they becoming more equal because their, their, their productivity growth is going up for all of them or going down for all of them? Obviously, we need upward, upward convergence, not convergence toward a lower, a lower level. So then I decided to, to, to represent here productivity developments in the different countries, just to show you uh, whether our expectations in terms of productivity are met. And so what we have here with the bars, basically on, on the left-hand side of the charts, are countries that are growing faster in do, two different periods in terms of productivity. And these are, I would say, all countries that had relatively lower uh, level of initial economic development. And so this is a welcoming sign. These are, these are countries that need to grow faster in terms of productivity in order to catch up with the others, to create the conditions for future growth that will allow them to, to reach up to the level of, the, of the, the economies that are above them in the, in the ranking of economic growth. And uh, of course, that's a good sign. But what is not such a positive sign is that the dark blue bars, which represent the period before the boom-bust cycle of the economic crisis are always higher, almost in all countries, not in all, but almost in all countries, than in the period afterwards. This is also seen in the US, by the way, in other developed economies, this uh, trend decline in productivity. And uh, I would say that for me a good sign is that countries like Portugal and Spain actually have higher productivity in the later period. And I would attribute at least some part of it to reforms and to, the, to changes in the structures of the economies that allow them to adapt to the modern economic developments. It's true that their productivity growth is still quite lower than in the, in the countries in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, so they are not converging as fast as before, but at least they're on the right track. I think that's what we see here. Now, when we talk about external rebalancing, that was an issue in the period before the crisis and during the crisis, we see downward sloping lines in competitiveness and current account balance. And that is natural because before the crisis, countries were gaining competitive competitiveness while others were losing competitiveness. While the crisis just made adjustment in such a way that competitiveness actually equalized a bit and countries that before were really really losing, uh, these are mostly Central European and Southern European countries are actually managed to adjust in this sense. Um, next, uh, I, I show convergence in, in, in certain labor and social conditions because in the end, that's how I started this presentation by showing that this is, this is, the, the, this is the metric that we would like to also to have in the picture and to be sure of the well-being of, of society. And uh, we, I must say that we have made some progress in terms of uh, cross-country differences in at risk of poverty and social exclusion rate. But unfortunately, this progress to some extent is because of a very big drop of the share of these people at risk in countries like Poland, Romania, Bulgaria. While at the same time, in certain of these middle-income countries, this uh, share has increased. And it has not, uh, this has not really led to positive development looking at the country level. At the, at the EU level, yes, but not at the country level. And the yellow line, which represents like, a metric of inequality, basically is, is flat. It has not really progressed as well as it could have been. And uh, data show that actually inequality has increased in most of the EU member states, not as much as in the US, for example, in recent years. And we are still more equal societies than the US, for example. But uh, we have not showed a lot of progress there. Now, uh, speaking about the, the, the future of the, of the economy and the, the importance of skills, of specialized skills and uh, the importance of education and human capital, I 
decided to have a metric that uh, shows this cross-country disparity between the different, uh, different uh, um, variables that relate to this issue. And what we see here on the left-hand side with the, with the dark blue line is basically a cyclical, a cyclical increase and decrease of, of uh, dispersion in terms of uh, uh, R&D spending in the, in the economies of the, of the EU28. And that is not so surprising given the fact that during crisis, countries have to really fill, fill up gaps and, and provide social security and R&D spending may suffer in certain countries. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the metric that measures educational attainment, the share of, uh, of population that has a terminal degree, educational degree, is, uh, is actually increasing the disparity between the countries. And this is uh, because certain countries, so for example, Ireland and uh, uh, um, Poland, if I'm not mistaken, are, are, are having or are seeing a very high increase in the share of people that are getting this uh, terminal degree and educational attainment, while others like Bulgaria and Romania are not seeing such, a, such an increase and the disparity increases. Finally, on the right-hand side, uh, related to the skills for the digital economy, I have shown the percent of, of underachievers in this un uh, standardized course in mathematics and, uh, and in reading that we have in Europe. And we see a very, very big cross-country dispersion in, in terms of the share of how many of these pupils are not able to meet the requirements of the educational level system and are likely to be unprepared for the new ways of uh, working in the new working environment where specialized skills are more and more important. So a lot has to be done here to have more unified or, or an improvement in those countries that are having uh, this, uh, this share of educational underachievers. Now, speaking a bit about regional convergence, so this is convergence within countries. Uh, we see that uh, basically the, the, the negative relationship between initial wealth and the change in wealth uh, is also present here, but to a large extent due to, again, regions in Eastern Europe. Uh, not so many countries, actually I, I can see only one country, has managed to achieve improvement in terms of within uh, country convergence and between country convergence. Most of them actually do achieve uh, convergence in terms of nationwide catching up with the, with the economic uh, leaders, but within their own countries, regional disparities increase. These are all countries that are in the upper left-hand side of the chart. So our, our regional picture is not much, within picture, regional picture is not uh, much better than the country picture. Uh, in terms of the role of, of, uh, of uh, fiscal policy and uh, redistribution by, by taxation system and the system of social support, we see that it works at the regional level because these uh, lines on the right-hand side, each one representing a more adjustable income for the population, are lower and lower. So the cross-country disparity decreases and over time also downward sloping, meaning that the redistributive system actually, when speaking about regional convergence, so within country fiscal systems, they, they work they, the way they should work. So that's of course a good sign. Um, now let me switch to, to the policy, to, 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 to the efforts that we all try to do in terms of improving the prospects of uh, convergence. And here I have a representation of the, of the role and of the, the importance of the different parts of the of the convergence uh, policy toolkit. And so what I have it is I have kind of separated in two important and main parts. One being the strengthening economic resilience. These are the, the blue, light blue uh, uh, shapes. And then on one hand, increasing the economic resilience and on the other, increasing living standards. And um, resilience can, on its part be broken down in two parts, reducing vulnerability of exposure to shocks and fostering adjustment capacity to shocks. Um, and uh, what we see here is that countries really need to work 
in different aspects. On one hand, uh, they have to address large and persi persistent cyclical differences. And at the same time, they have to address income differences. These are the orange, orange shapes. And then uh, in, uh, in green, I show uh, what is the likely time horizon for managing to achieve these, these goals. And uh, you see that uh, some of them have short to medium term impact like this. Uh, basically addressing a, a crisis when it hits. But others have more long-term long -term nature, like uh, managing to, to address large and persistent income, income differences. And when we now talk about concretely the, the policy toolkit, these are yellow shapes, basically we can divide it into parts, structural reforms, still the prerogative of the member states, and of course, we talk here about education policy and, and human, improving human capital in, in terms of, uh, let's say, spending on research and development and improving skills um, on one hand. On the other hand, improving the business environment and the way business is done in these countries. So uh, reducing, let's say, red tape, uh, facilitating procedures, um, providing uh, faster and efficient and impartial uh, uh, judgment by courts, and um, all these, all these, uh, all these different policies help business environment and encourage investment also from abroad. Um, finally, I, I, some of these policies are also directly related to investment, also public investment, which, no matter the fact that it's uh, relatively small compared to the whole investment in in most of the countries still gives a very good proper signal because it's all already happening in areas that are difficult to, to, to be entered by, by private investors in some, in some cases and also provides, provides uh, infrastructure that is useful for investment of other types by private, uh, private agents. Of course, the role of the EU here is, is quite large. We have managed to, to to progress quite a lot since the, the time of the crisis kind of taught us a lesson that we have to, to build our, our union stronger and economically more resilient. So I can mention here the banking union, the, the capital markets union initiatives, the, the, the single market that of course exists for a long time, but it, it needs to be strengthened and needs to be made even more encompassing and uh, different budgetary support tools, the Invest EU program and its predecessor. Uh, now more concretely about the, the different uh, policy tools that we're using, and here in this slide I'm only concentrated on the ones that have recently come up in, in recent years, of course again spurred by the crisis and by the desire of, of, of uh, policy makers and the society to address these problems. Uh, but of course, we should not omit, for example, regional policy that has in existed for, for many years and it has served its role and it will continue to serve its role. But it's something that has been like a foundation policy of the EU. Uh, so of course, we talk about the European semester here, which uh, creates a platform for multilateral surveillance for, for supporting policies by giving good examples. And, uh, and by, by making countries uh, feel part of a union, actually, that is deciding together for the benefit of everybody through consensus and discussion. Um, benchmarking is a very useful tool. I could maybe think of an example. Here's the convergence reports that all the countries have to, uh, have to uh, be assessed with uh, if they would like to join the monetary union. This is just a a way to identify progress and to monitor progress and, uh, and maybe hint at reforms. This, of course, now the connection between convergence reports and the semester. Uh, we are talking here about the budgetary instrument for convergence and competitiveness, which is now at, uh, I would say, negotiation level, uh, something that, uh, of course, is designed to encourage structural reforms, investment as well. And, um, and to, and to build an incentive, you know, an additional incentive to, to, to reform by countries. Um, National Productivity Boards, one initiative that we had uh, spurned by the five presidents report, 
uh, to create uh, national ownership. So an institution that is at the national member state, at the, at the capital or somewhere in the member state, and it's close to the people that are affected by reforms, close to the people that implement reforms. And so it's providing them evidence-based policy making. It's providing as a, as a, also a network to show how others are doing. <laughs> And of course, the, the recently created structural reforms of all service that helps technical assistance sometimes in implementation is difficult because the administration of the, the, the country concerned may not have the experience that others have. And so this is an important element as well of our policy toolkit. Um, finally, let me stress the role of economic policies in boosting convergence. Um, First, I would like to say this is by no means an impossibility trinity that we see very often. Uh, here, I would like to say that uh, these elements of, of the structural reform paradigm, fairness, efficiency, sustainability are possible to be achieved together, and they should be achieved together. Of course, it is difficult to do so, but, but, but we have to strive to, to have the fairness element, the efficiency element, and the sustainability element in our in our reform packages. And what fairness will give us, for example, will empower people to, 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 to feel part of the reform process, somebody that benefits from reforms, not just somebody that is a subject of, uh, object of reforms, somebody that's a subject of reforms. And um, uh, it will create growth that is inclusive, productivity that is inclusive, that there are no people left behind and uh, of course, uh, yes, here I mentioned intergenerational balance, of course, because sometimes reform impacts are concentrated to, to different parts of the, of the age distribution. And of course, reforms need to be efficient. Uh, they, they should support the single market. They should help openness. They should, um, they should uh, strive to create a, an environment that fosters technological progress and helps firms and people take benefit from the advancement of technology and make them more competitive vis-a-vis -vis different other economic powers. And uh, sustainability as well is a, an important element. And uh, um, we talk about security also in terms of economics, not just political security, of course, but economic security has become more important in our more interconnected world. And uh, this policy mix between macro, macro policy in general, monetary, fiscal policy, financial policy, uh, should include structural, structural policies as well. Um, now, I probably should not remind you about the environmental issues that we are facing, since this is a topic that is being discussed right now. Um, environmental impact of reforms also needs to be in the picture. Um, so. I decided to illustrate here the role of the business environment for, for adjustment after the crisis. So here I have a relationship between uh, the ease of doing business in the years just as the crisis started. So this is the initial position of countries and their, and their recovery path, how fast they have managed to recover it. And you see a very good positive relationship. So countries that had a more flexible economy, that had a business environment that was facilitating um, adjustment, that was facilitating foreign investment, for example, um, also managed to recover faster. And this is not a, is not a surprise because, of course, uh, um, when demand is, is stuck in your country, you need to rely on, on, on others, on foreigners to demand for your goods, to invest in your economies, to bring up a spur, a new spur in your, in your economy, and you have to attract them somehow. You have to create the conditions that they feel secure for their investment and, uh, and for, for, for the future of their project in your country. And uh, what I also decided to illustrate here is a convergence metric in, in, terms of, in terms of product markets. What we would like to see basically is a country that was initially more restrictive in terms of their product markets, is a country also that has made a more or a, or a more consistent and stronger effort in terms of product market reform. So we have this relationship here. Countries that were at a more restrictive product market uh, 
uh, product market level were also the ones that were reforming the most. And uh, let me just uh, finish up with, uh, with some challenges for, for structural reforms, some criticism the structural reforms has actually taken and for the best practices that these structural, structural reforms can take from experience. Well, we all know that benefits of structural reforms are widely spread while costs are concentrated. So we have to have ways to compensate losers. And uh, we, we do know that, especially in terms of zero law bound or restrictive monetary policies, there are negative short term effects of, of reforms. So we do need to have good social safety nets that do not allow people to fall behind. Uh, reforms tend to be complex sometimes. So of course we need better communication. So everybody can understand why importance of reforms is, is a key. And um, we sometimes are missing quantitative evidence when we implement reforms. So we have to invest in analysis of the impacts. We have to provide well-founded arguments to counter the bias against reforms that is sometimes really not founded on, on any evidence. We have to provide technical assistance uh, in order to, to help implementation of reforms. And uh, it's important to have the right sequence of, of reforms. Sometimes uh, just the sequence can change the, the, change the picture. Uh, postponing some reforms until recovery, if possible, is also a solution, but of course not always. Uh, it, 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 does, it does happen, but I mean, we have to look at the particular circumstances. Sometimes countries are really pressed to the wall and they have to, they have to adjust. Uh, complementarity is another important element here. And finally, of course, and very important is to build up political support for reforms in the, in the countries that will undergo them because without the political support in a, in a democratic society as ours, uh, this will backfire and there will be, there will be a reform reversal. Uh, finally, I would like to just finish up with three challenges for the future, the, 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 the digitalization, the, the, the globalization and aging provide for convergence. Well, we are, we are uh, in, a, in an environment where, where, the, where the digital transformation is actually causing a lot of changes in our societies. And some countries and some regions in, the, in Europe can actually uh, benefit more than others. So we have to have a way to, we have to, have a way to, 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 to address this impact. Globalization is a similar case. Some regions and countries are more adept in taking the benefits of globalization. And finally, as I talked about intergenerational differences, aging tends to be also an, an important element that we need to address. So thank you for attention, and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> that, was, um, that was indeed a very comprehensive uh, presentation. You took double the time that was allotted wow. to you. Uh, so I'm afraid we have to move on uh, immediately. Perhaps we can have some discussion uh, to some of the points you took up, but uh, we have to move on, I'm afraid. Uh, Cynthia, what do you think about of all of this? Okay, first of all, many, many thanks for inviting me. Uh, the issue is, uh, is certainly uh, very important. This was already said. I have to say it's also very close to, to my personal interest in, in doing research, uh, not least because uh, uh, actually commenting this presentation allow me to try to put together a number of findings of uh, recent research um, which I have, uh, I have done. I will focus my comments on two aspects. The first one on convergence um, and the fact that we have many concepts of convergence. This was the starting point of the presentation of, of Plamen and the second one on structural reforms. I have some slides but I will skip because the presentation was very comprehensive. I don't need to go uh, into too many details. So many concepts of, of convergence, nominal, convergence of cycles or cycle synchronization, real convergence and then input convergence. The, the last part of the presentation for instance on skills education is very much on input convergence, so the elements which are driving uh, growth. And here my, my main point and this is what I want to discuss and try to, to spot trade-offs is uh, the common element of all these different concepts of convergence is that basically there is a common aspiration of uh, having member states which are more similar. Uh, whether in the outcome, in the structure, or in the inputs. And what I'm asking myself is whether this really happened 
to what extent it happened, whether it's always desirable, and what are the drivers of it. And then on, on structural reforms, I will uh, discuss it later. I will focus on two concepts of um, convergence. Uh, cycles, because I did some research on this, and then real convergence. So um, not long ago, I started to, to look uh, at the degree of synchronization of, of cycles, of business cycles, um, focusing on the euro area. It was said earlier, this is uh, considered uh, usually a precondition to have a monetary policy which can function well. Um, we built a, a quite sophisticated indicator of uh, synchronization of cycles, and then I compared the euro area to the United States. And basically, what you see in, in the left hand side, I'm not going to the details, uh, is that for the euro area synchronization of cycles has been always quite high. If you see the 90s until uh, basically 2016, this has been increasing with some waves, but always very high. So this indicator is, is not the traditional correlation indicators, but if we make a translation, it, it says that in 2016, the synchronization of cycles, it was close to 0 0.9, which is very high. And it's actually, it's much higher than the United States. Now, my question here is, uh, was this representative of a context where monetary policy had an easy task to perform? My answer is not necessarily. So probably there are other things going on. And, and here, my point would be that business cycle synchronization may be desirable, desirable for a monetary policy point of view, but necess not necessarily a sufficient condition so that monetary policy has an easy task. The second comment that, that I have here, and this is more related to the, the work on, on risk sharing, <laughs> which I have discussed with, uh, with Frank and some other people in, in the room, is that uh, Actually, for a number of mechanisms that we are envisaging to have a resilient monetary union, we do not really want to have synchronization of cycles because we are looking for diversification. So again, here, my point is to, to what extent convergence of cycles, for instance, is per se an objective, and to what extent this should drive policies all the time. I do not have an answer, but I, I'm really trying to, to spot uh, potential uh, trade-offs and, 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 and issues. Let me move quickly to, to real convergence. Um, this is a chart which was uh, already showed. I'm focusing here on EU member states. Basically, what we see is evidence of convergence, mostly driven by Central Eastern European countries. So uh, if, if you look at convergence, this is really an East-West phenomenon. Uh, the, the countries in, in, uh, in, uh, in green are basically Southern European countries, and this was already mentioned. These are actually those who struggled the most uh, to be part of this uh, process of, uh, of convergence. If we look at regions, uh, of course, everything is, is, is more dispersed, but it's, it seems to, to confirm uh, what we have seen already for, for, for the member states. Um, yet, if we start to look into countries, and here I just put the example of uh, some new member states. What you see is actually strong evidence of divergence. Um, actually, this pattern can be found also in other um, advanced economies and also all, 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 all member states. But it, it's <coughs> very strong uh, in, in this kind of countries where basically the capital city, the capital region has been uh, driving the entire process of, of convergence uh, while the rural area have, uh, have been left behind. So here my main message is, uh, again, if we want to look at real convergence, Maybe we should go beyond what we see in terms of member states happening at the level of member states, and we need to go deeper and more down. And uh, issues about divergence, if you want, is, uh, um, is important for the EU, but also for member states. Think of the Yellow West in France. Sorry, that is a reflection of dynamics whereby you have uh, uh, everything happening in the capital city and, and then the rest which is, which is left behind. And then the question is, I will skip this, um, why? What, what is happening? What is happening? And uh, um, uh, Plumman um, pointed out that the crisis may have had uh, a, a large impact. Uh, this can be the case. 
Um, there my comment would be, if it is the crisis, then the most important is to come out of the crisis and some elements should be improving. Uh, but the question I want to put on the table is whether th there is something which is more structural, more profound, which is going on. And uh, what I did, I went back to, to a strand of, of literature, which is the, the new economic geography, which is uh, basically pointing to, to the fact that when you have regional integration, so uh, um, elimination of the obstacles for uh, free movement of uh, capital resources uh, labor, what you may end up with is, is not necessarily a convergence process. Uh, because you actually end up with agglomeration. And uh, uh, a number of phenomena that we are observing, um, for instance, the, the concentration in, in um, capital cities or what is happening in London, in, in Paris, uh, may seem to, 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 to lead towards a situation where we have very strong centres, uh, where there is a high concentration of income, production and productivity, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, parts of regions and, and cities which are really struggling uh, to keep the pace. And this, I think, brings us to a very fundamental question about what the EU can do and what also member states can do. Whether we actually need to favour productivity and in concentration, because uh, in, on average uh, the, the, the values are better off, or whether we need to take care of uh, those and those regions which are, are left behind. And this is a, it's a very critical political issue and a choice. Um, um, just to give an example, in Norway, which is a very advanced and very spread country, uh, national agencies are spread all over the territory. And this is just a choice, because there is a very strong message that the government is present everywhere, that no one is, is forgotten. That is a choice. Mm, possibly and realistically, it's not the most efficient way to go. But, but that, is, that is a really a very fundamental trade-off, and, and I think this is, this is what we need to, to, um, uh, to, to discuss about. Um, I will be... Let, let me move to, I, I'm really happy to, to discuss this, this part. Let me move to the, to the issue of the structural reforms. Now, uh, structural reforms are, um, in, in principle, if you look at the, the definition, um, should be really um, welcomed by everyone. In fact, that's not the case. And these are very much politically charged. I mean, uh, the IMF, the Washington Consensus, uh, Thatcher, Reagan, the, the, the liberalization uh, policies, and are very much associated with a concept whereby capital is taking the benefits of the reform while labor is actually paying the cost of, of the reform. Because structural reforms, as it was said earlier, tend to have localized uh, losses. There are groups, individuals, or part of societies, or maybe uh, territories, which are actually uh, paying for, for certain uh, structural change, while in aggregate, uh, again, the, 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 the outcome may, may be um, uh, uh, positive. But it is a very strong distributional effect, uh, whereby um, uh, structural reforms are actually uh, uh, made uh, uh, difficult. And here, uh, maybe, if we look at the, the, the European context, the, the, one of the very fundamental questions is, uh, do all countries have to implement the same kind of structural reforms to have a structure of the economy which is more similar, which then make the functioning of, of the Union easier or better? And that is a question. And there is a very fundamental question because social preferences are different, but also economic models in the member states are different. And one of the questions uh, putting forward is what kind of, of benchmark for structural reform is set? Do we all need to look like Germany? This is, this is a typical kind of, uh, of, of question which is, which is put on, uh, on the table. Uh, and these uh, are issues that need to be discussed. Um, my thinking also projected on, um, on the situation of my home country, Italy, which is uh, always the, the, the elephant in, in the room, is uh, to what extent actually specific reforms are important, which in many cases are, and to what extent the, the, the institutional framework, so the, the basically 
those elements which set the condition whereby certain changes are actually applied and can deliver outcome are important. And of course, how this, uh, um, this can be um, uh, delivered. So I think uh, I will just stop here and then I'm happy to uh, discuss further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. It's a very um, interesting uh, points and uh, above all questions. It's time to open up to uh, the floor. Uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, any thoughts, comments? <coughs> I'm sure there are. We've been dazzled by the, the length <laughs> and the depth of the presentations. I'm sure there must be someone. Frank, I can always rely on you, Frank. Just a question for... Sorry. Just a question for uh, a clarification uh, for uh, Plamen. Um, you, you made a distinction between observations based on, say, GDP and observations based on income, and that distinction is notably important when you look at within-country regional convergence or divergence, yeah, because <coughs> you might say, well, even if there is an agglomeration effect in a country, because of the way the tax and benefit system and the whole welfare state works, this might be redistributed. Huh? Uh, so we shouldn't worry too much. That, that's the kind of argument I sometimes hear when, 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 when this is discussed, this kind of agglomeration effects and within-country divergence. So I was wondering, how did your slide exactly show that indeed, I, that's the way I understood, that indeed the within-country divergence in prosperity is kind of compensated or neutralized by redistributive systems? I understood that you were making that point, but um, I'm not sure. Well, uh, the, I don't know if I can go back to the slide. But, um, basically, the, the slide was taking all the, all the regions together. And so, obviously, um, this was in a way eliminating the country specifics. And so, uh, um, we could actually argue that in some countries this has increased. The, 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 the distributive system might not have actually worked that well, but when you take them all together, and by and large, uh, for, the, for, for example, for the, for the one that, that, for the real convergence picture that was on the left-hand side, by and large that was driven by Central and Eastern European countries. On the, on the right-hand side, we had the cross-country disparity, and without knowing which country did what, we could not really say uh, what we would like to know and what you were pointing. So basically it was showing that overall, if we consider the EU as one big country, yes, cross-country uh, dispersion in terms of <coughs> disposable income is lower than in terms of income in general or GDP. But we don't know just by looking at this picture. And so there is cross-country difference in that likely, which of course we have to be mindful of as well. Yeah, maybe sure. on, uh, on this. I think this is this is a very important point, no? Because uh, in principle, uh, I say that, that there is an issue within countries and at the European level. In principle, within countries, maybe less of an issue if you have a good redistributive mechanism. So you can you can still have uh, a lot of income, uh, then it's taxed, and then it redistributed to the regions lagging behind. Now th there are two elements. So it depends very much on the country. So how powerful the welfare system uh, is in terms of, of redistributing. And the second thing where that there is actually now a growing debate is whether people are happy about this or they're satisfied about this. Or maybe they just want to work and they don't, don't want necessarily to, to have um, welfare. And, and, and this, is, this is a very fundamental question. But uh, uh, for instance, in the comparison in the uh, inequality between the United States and, and Europe, Europe is doing definitely better because the welfare system is more powerful than in the United States. Uh, but this is, uh, I think this is another uh, very important question. Ruth and uh, this gentleman here, we take, we take the two. <coughs> Please, uh, 
Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruth Passerman, I'm the Deputy Head of Cabinet of Commissioner Tace in dealing with employment and social affairs. Um, okay, I'm trying to get my mind uh, together, but I think the main points I want to do has to be <laughs> about correlation is not causation. And I think this, uh, I found one of your, a couple of your slides uh, a bit troubling on that because you have a graph. Um, you had one about uh, the productivity and GDP, I mean, sorry, GDP growth uh, correlated to various uh, mm. indicators, of which one was, for example, um, productivity or investment. So these were all positive correlations. Mm. And then you have like employment. unemployment, which had a ter negative correlation. But of course, I don't think that it is unemployment that creates low GDP growth. It's rather low GDP growth that creates unemployment. So um, I think that graph is a bit worrying, to be honest, to show around. That's <coughs> first point. Second point also on the, um, I think it was GDP productivity growth in the period 2000 to 2006 and 2006 to 2018, something like that, where you commented about Portugal and Spain having done better in the second period compared to the previous period, which is true, but on the other hand, Greece was very striking. It was one of the top countries in the first period mm. and terrible in the second period. Mm. So I would like to hear that, comments about that. Then on the, another correlation versus causation is the issue more highlighted by Cinzia on the, on the um, efficiency gains of uh, agglomeration versus redistribution. Also here, I'm not sure, I mean, the, the, what is, in which order is the causation? I mean, is agglomeration leading to gra greater productivity growth or is greater productivity growth efficiency of administration mm -hmm. rather bringing to uh, agglomeration? And I think this is, in a way, I mean, that makes me think of countries and you know, both Ger Germany, let's say currently the best performance and Italy currently the bad performer are not touched by this agglomeration effects <laughs> like France and the UK, so this. We take this uh, other point and then we can uh, let the panelists uh, please introduce yourself. Um, I'm uh, Rudy van Dam uh, from the Belgian Ministry for Social Security and chairing uh, of the group of the, the indicators group of the Social Protection Committee. Yeah. Um, I have a, a question on the slide uh, concerning the tools uh, for convergence. I think the title was with the two with the scheme uh, with the two uh, parts, one of for resilience, the other one for uh, living conditions. Um, and my uh, remark is a bit uh, in, 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 the, in the spirit, let's say, of uh, one of the teams of the Finnish presidency, which is on the economics of well-being. Mm. Um, and I noticed that in your slide, you, uh, well, on the first, uh, first uh, uh, point is that the left part, which is on resilience, was much more developed than the right part on, on living conditions. And secondly, uh, there is an arrow from the left side on resilience to the right side uh, living conditions, but not the other way around. Is, is it, shouldn't there be also an arrow conceptually uh, from living conditions to resilience? Ask the speakers maybe just to have a, a, res a brief response to that. And I saw there are some other uh, questions as well. So if you could give a reasonably precise response, then we can get some more input from the floor. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, these are just associations between growth and different metrics. This is not causation. We would like to know more about causation, but <coughs> it's done in a different way. And you're definitely right. Which is, which is the chicken? Which is the egg? Indeed. I mean, this is an important point, and it has to be done properly. This is just associations here. Uh, regarding Greece, indeed, it experienced a very deep recession, and uh, that also affected productivity in a, in a much negative way. So, um, of course, Greece is also doing reforms. It's just they start from a very, very difficult level. So we have to bear with them to, to some extent. Um, on the economics of well-being, indeed, uh, your point is right. Um, there, is, there, there should be an error on the other way around. I mean, this just looks more developed on the left-hand side because of the way I made the... Uh, if I had more space or if I had drawn it with my hand, <laughs> I would have elaborated in a, in a different way. But it, maybe it creates this impression, but your point is well, well received. Maybe very quickly, just... Uh, you're very right. 
Uh, Germany is actually uh, a very dispersed country, so, uh, country with, with many different centers. This may be related to the, to the economic model and, and the fact that uh, we had this uh, European factory with Germany and a lot of uh, uh, Slovakia, all the countries around it, which uh, were basically the main drivers of the manufacturing. But it's true, Germany is very different. Well, Italy, it was always the north-south divide. Now, Milan is really emerging as a, as, a, as a center, but the phenomenon is very far from what is happening in, in, in London and, uh, in, um, and in Paris, where the concentration of services, it's mostly services, uh, which is in, in, in this city with a reinforcing um, um, phenomenon, uh, amplifying phenomenon between concentration and higher productivity. But now we are having congestion costs. Uh, so the concentration now is so high that, that the cost of living is, is so high, for instance, that the periphery of the cities have to become larger and larger in order to allow the middle class to be able actually to pay a rent uh, in something which is still called London and, and Paris. Um, Thank you. The gentleman at the back. <clears throat> Thank you. And then, and then that's it. Yes, thank you. I'm Angel Catarina from DG ECFIN in the Commission. I wanted to make a question related to uh, the fact that both of you have emphasized that we are observing increasing agglomeration economies, that investment tends to concentrate on some regions and give rise to, addition, to more divergence. My comment or my assumption, I, I, it's an assumption I wanted to, to discuss with you, is that I mean, for better convert, beta convergence to happen, there is a strong assumption behind, which is the decreasing, decreasing marginal product of capital. So every additional unit of capital provides lower returns than, than, the, than, than the first one, okay? My point is that in the new economy, like I mean, with, with, where skills are very important, where you have platform economies, where probably the fact is that this assumption that does not work anymore. And uh, the marginal product of capital is constant or even increasing with an additional, if, if I just to put an example, if you put in, in a very, let's say, in, in knowledge economy, you put an additional person which has a very good level of, of education, mm -hmm. the return of this person may be higher than the first one because there is a critical mass. So I wanted to ask you to what extent this is what may, what may have been observing in the recent past. With the new economy, the decrease in marginal product of capital is not observed anymore. And of course, this is uh, a condition for beta convergence, and so beta convergence is not happening. Uh, on the contrary, we are having more divergence because of that. Okay. Thank and then you. one more point for the gentleman here, that you, the microphone, um, and then we'll... Um, Herbert Dürrl, Chairman of uh, Federal Ministry for Labour and Social Affairs. I liked very much the, the question of Chincha, do we all uh, need to be like in Germany? And uh, my, my, the, the, the other speaker said it already, we have agglomeration effects which are different from the past. So the, the, the German model was always to have regional clusters of high productivity, but the other regions were connected in some way. And, 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 and the discussion we, we have is now, now, are these agglomeration effects so strong that there are regions lagging behind because there is no rubber band between these regions. So you have not, not the exchange of internal mobility and so on. And you, you, you could see it in, uh, in Germany as well. So the, the, the conversion of the eastern part of Germany was accompanied with uh, leaving around one-fifth of the population going to, to the western parts, and now they are, on a, on a, are a population like in, at the beginning of the 20th century. So, 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 so that there were a lot of processes, and, and this, this would be on a EU level. What is the policy level? You, you, you said, put it right. What do you uh, promote? Do you promote cathedrals in the deserts? No, surely not. That's not. It would be not a German model or so. But to which extent do you promote lacking regions? This is a really a uh, tricky question. Okay, let's have a brief uh, comment from our uh, panelists here, and then we will conclude the session. Uh, mm. Yes, on the on the remark about the increasing uh, marginal product of capital. Yes, there is a lively debate about this also in the European Commission. Uh, 
there is also a debate about, uh, let's say, fixed costs that this, uh, these firms are facing. For example, in order to achieve whatever these technological, big technological firms are doing, you need to pass a threshold of having this infrastructure in place. And this is, this is quite important and maybe that prevents others from entering, uh, entering into this business. And so uh, I think this is a, an issue that needs to be researched more, analyzed more and investigated more so that we are able to, to find out what in exactly is in place. But of course, that might be a, I mean, that might be a easy or, or a, a suitable, suitable candidate for explaining uh, this uh, lack of convergence. Maybe very, very briefly on, on this, it is true that the standard original assumption was neoclassical, no? That you have uh, uh, capital can move freely and uh, where there is less capital, return is higher, so capital should go there and that th there is better convergence. Um, now, we saw that it's not really what happens, uh, so I think there are two dimensions. One is, of course, the new economy, digitalization, all these aspects, but also the kind of thinking about agglomeration is, is different from the, the typical neoclassical one. Huh? Uh, it is one where there is much more emphasis on, on economies of scale, on the fact that when, when you concentrate, you have more infrastructure and uh, production in, in a sense and creation of income becomes easier. Uh, plus, of course, there are all these uh, big trends, mostly digitalization and, and, and technology, which are coming at the same time and affecting the way we produce. We are moving from manufacturing to services. Even, even in Germany, the manufacturing, a lot of it is actually services. It's, it's not just production of, of goods. And of course, all this has, uh, uh, has an impact on uh, the mechanisms of um, location and reallocation of, uh, of production. Yeah, indeed, you, you made reference to the new economic geography, economies of scale, and I think in the new economy that we're seeing now today, uh, the, there are uh, very different types of economies of scale. It's more about network economies, network effects and uh, agglomeration effects. And essentially this brings us back to uh, the single market and structural funds and, uh, and so on. Uh, let's conclude there. We, uh, the premise of this uh, conference was that the economic and social are intertwined and I'm sure that we will return to many of these intertwined questions in the next session which will now begin immediately. Thank you uh, all very much indeed. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat>
I will describe uh, uh, this paradigm shift uh, between uh, from uh, economic convergence to economic and social convergence that we discuss now, and then I will present uh, the results uh, of our uh, investigation on social convergence in employment and socioeconomic factors that you may find here in this report that uh, has been published today and you have found on, our, on your on your chairs. And then uh, I will just uh, uh, introduce some of possible actions that can be done in order to promote uh, uh, sustainable uh, convergence. Because I think that uh, it's the word sustainable that is important in, in when we talk about upward convergence. So basically, okay, we are here to discuss economic and social convergence, but uh, the concept of convergence was mainly linked to economic, was the economic convergence uh, which is uh, and was especially at the core of the policy discourse. In fact, uh, is this uh, economic meaning of convergence that uh, appears in the Treaty of the European Union in 92 as uh, uh, relating to monetary and fiscal convergence in order to access to uh, the economic and monetary union. And uh, it also appears in the preamble of this treaty when we talk about coordination of, of, of economic policy policies of member states. Uh, and this for probably because it reflects uh, the climate uh, or the paradigm, original paradigm of uh, the founders of the, U of the European Union project where economic integration was uh, uh, taught to happen or, and organized at the European Union level while domestic social policies uh, uh, were apt to redistribute the fruits of uh, economic prosperity. Now, this paradigm works, actually. We can say that it worked, and it worked very well. Uh, and we had the so-called uh, economic convergence machine, as uh, uh, said uh, earlier, and as defined by the word, the word bank. So, every, so this process in which uh, poor or least performing countries uh, were improving their uh, economic performances and the social performances, and were in the process of reaching the best performing countries. But it worked very well till, till the economic crisis. The economic crisis in 2008, it stopped this trend and uh, it caused member states to diverge both in the economic and in the social dimension. Uh, so uh, a lot of differences emerged in especially the social dimension. Unemployment in Greece uh, went up to more, more, it was more than seven times higher than the one in Czech Republic. And Italians long, youth long-term unemployed was more than 20 times higher than the Danish one if the share of unemployed was, was considered. So this was... Uh, uh, the, the, the motto of the European Union is united in diversity, actually, but surely these are not uh, uh, the differences that uh, we are proud of. In fact, uh, uh, these differences uh, and these uh, diverging economic and social performance weren't a common concern uh, among, uh, uh, I mean, for the stability uh, of the European Union. Uh, in fact, uh, they contracted uh, the promise of a shared prosperity, and actually, and they may signal a lowering of working and living conditions in Europe. They especially contradict the citizens' expectations, citizens and member states' expectations that joining the European Union would bring to better working and living conditions. And as a result uh, of this uh, uh, broken promise, the consensus and the support toward the European Union may lower, as we may have seen in the past, in the past years. And probably uh, citizens would be more receptive of uh, possible political promises of third countries. Uh, so in recent years, actually, the concept of convergence changes meaning. From uh, the economic, actually, it went beyond the economic dimension, and it increasingly, uh, uh, it was increasingly put greater emphasis on the social dimension of convergence. This paradigm shift actually started in 2012, if you can resume, actually, with, uh, uh, with uh, the four president report, when discussing a fiscal and banking union, also emphasis was given 
to the social imbalances that were exploding at the time we were in the middle of the crisis uh, in European performances. Then it kept with the five president report where much more attention was given to the labor market and social dimension and then it kept uh, with also in 2017 with the white paper of the European Union where the term convergence is, is quoted just once actually just once is mentioned the word convergence but it's very important because uh, it said that in order to strengthen in, or, in order to uh, uh, complete the economic and monetary union member states should strengthen their economic and social convergence so for the first time, the two worlds were together uh, as part uh, of the same process. And then actually this, uh, this shift, paradigm shift probably uh, can be uh, considered to be uh, I mean, concluded with the European pillar of social rights. The European pillar of social rights was proclaimed in 2017 in Gothenburg, uh, second time in the history of the Union where we have a proclamation uh, proclaimed by all the uh, uh, heads of state of the member states. Uh, the pillar provides uh, 20 principles uh, and uh, uh, it aims at serve as a compass for uh, a renewed process of upward convergence among member states in the economic and in the social dimension. So the concept of convergence is then uh, uh, come back uh, also considering both, both sides as a result of the implementation of the pillar or the possible <coughs> implementation of the pillar. So the question is, uh, uh, is Europe converging upward in the social dimension of the European Union. And this is what uh, uh, we aimed at uh, investigating with the project that we carried out. First of all, I mean, what does it mean, upward convergence? Because it's a term that uh, is mentioned a lot of times, but what is the meaning, actually? Well, in order to clarify, upward convergence means uh, to improve member state performance towards uh, a possible policy target. So it can be uh, improvement of employment rates or decrease of early school leavers. So it's not that upward only always means maximization, but it means to improve the performance of the member states toward the desired uh, target. Converging, on the other hand, is reducing member states' differences. So now narrowing the differences in our performances while we are improving our performances. So in our investigation, actually, we have uh, uh, investigated uh, convergence, upward convergence in 21 indicators that cover labor market participation, labor market exclusion, uh, dynamics of participation to the labor market, as well as uh, income related variables, education related variables, uh, and gender and poverty related variables. Uh, among the indicators investigated, 10 are part of the uh, uh, social scoreboard accompanying the European pillar of social rights. So 10 are the headlines indicators of the social scoreboard and additional four are the indicators that we investigated that are part of the, of the social scoreboard. So, what is the results, actually? The results, uh, and I won't present the results of the 21 indicators because otherwise uh, my share actually will close the session when I am in the middle. Uh, we can say that uh, uh, different forces are at play when we see converge, when we investigate convergent trends in, social, in the social areas. So basically three main blocks we can, can be found. The first one is where Convergence is strong and steady. So the trends observed in improvement and in, and in the um, disparities of member states are strong and steady and are not affected by business cycle fluctuations, are not affected by the crisis, these trends. Then there is a second group of indicators where actually convergence happens in good time. In good time, we have uh, upward convergent trends, uh, but then there is uh, a great impact of the business cycles. Uh, and in bad time, we have downward divergence. So we started to go down and we are all different. So this group uh, is now performing quite well because uh, we have, uh, I mean, a good economic uh, period, but it's a group of indicators where instability can be found. And then a third group where more work needed to be done uh, because uh, downward trends uh, are, still, uh, are still there. So briefly, let's, 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 uh, let's have a look of these uh, three, three main groups, actually. The first one is the group 
strong and steady. Uh, here, the effect of the crisis was very limited, uh, limited fluctuations uh, uh, around the business cycles, both in levels, but especially in disparities of member states. Uh, these indicators are quite a good set, a long set of indicators, and that basically include education-related indicators, gender gap indicators, activity rate, children in formal childcare, and income-related indicators. So for all these indicators, the situation is good, is strong, is stable toward improvement. Uh, for these indicators, interestingly, uh, euro area uh, uh, converge uh, more than the non-euro area. Of course, this investigation is a bit, uh, is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, uh, difficult because the, the shoe entities have changed during the time. But this is the trend that we found because uh, uh, most, in most of the indicators, not in income, but in the rest, in the gender gap and in, in education related, convergent trends was driven by South Mediterranean member states, especially, uh, that started with a very uh, uh, poor, poor situation and, and improved actually considerably. In order to show a little bit more of, of, these, of these dynamics, this, is, for example, is the early school level rates. The purple is the uh, average, so the level of the indicators, and the blue is the standard deviation. What we can see is that we observed a constant decrease of the early school level rates, rate toward the political objective, and uh, also the diversity of, me of uh, member states decreased steady in the last, in the last 17 years. Uh, then the same, but the opposite sign, is the, child, is the children under age of three in formal childcare. Here we have some fluctuation of the standard deviation, but the uh, uh, rate is increasingly steady uh, in, the last, in the last 14 years. Uh, then in order to show the difference between euro area and non-euro area, I will present you the gender employment gap. The gender employment gap, yes, it has uh, a bit of fluctuation at the beginning of the crisis due to the nature of the crisis, but in general, we can say that the traditional decrease of the, and reduction of the gender employment gap was confirmed over the entire period, and in the same period, member states decrease their differences uh, in the gender employment gap. If we divide the analysis between euro area and non-euro area, we can see that the red is the euro area and the blue is the non-euro area, we can see that the euro area decreased the gender employment gap much more than the non-euro area countries. This trend was mainly driven by South Mediterranean member states that saw a, a, a marked decrease of the gap. Now, let's move now to another group, actually and uh, is the group uh, where we have upward convergence in, in, good, in just in good times. I think this is a, is a very, is very important group uh, and is also very interesting for all the implications that it has. Now, for, 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 for this group, actually, uh, convergence trends were strongly affected by the economic crisis and a strong cyclical evolution was, was recorded for this, for this indicator, both for averages and, and variability. Uh, for these indicators, actually, we have a port convergence in good times where things go well economically. We have strong port convergence. When, we, when uh, bad times arrive, there is downward divergence. So we decrease our performances and we become uh, very different, actually. So, for sure, for these indicators, uh, port convergent trends are not basically sustainable in the sense that they are very affected by, by the economic cycle. Uh, these indicators are, are quite key indicators and are the indicators related to employment participation, uh, labor market exclusion as unemployed needs, etc., and poverty and material deprivation indicators. For these indicators, uh, in the, last, in the last 15, 17 years, uh, Euro area member states did better than Euro area member states. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is the case of being, uh, uh, as these are key indicators and uh, they are greatly uh, uh, affected by the business cycle, uh, probably these indicators indicate the areas and the policy domains where member states should strengthen their resilience 
in order to prevent future asymmetric shocks, future shocks that then become asymmetric, so that sustainable convergence can be built in these indicators, in, in the policy domains that these indicators are measuring. Uh, so let's have a look uh, of some dynamics of, this, of, this, of the indicators of this group. Here I consider employment rate and ROPI rate. Of course, here the, the upward direction is different. For employment rate, we want a maximization of the indicators. For the Europe, we want a decrease of the indicators. But the trend is absolutely the same. Again, purple is the average, blue is the disparities of member states. What we see is that, that before the crisis, we observe in both indicators a, a upward convergent trends followed by a downward divergent trends where disparities increased among member states and the level de decreased actually uh, in terms of improvement. And then as soon as the recovery arrived, we had upward convergent trends again. So uh, we have read uh, uh, yesterday or two days ago that uh, OECD said that the macroeconomic perspectives are cooling in, 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 the, in the near future. So yeah, what will happen in these indicators if a new recession arrives? How the disparities among member states will behave? Now, this is uh, in order to show the difference between euro area and non-euro area for these indicators that is completely the opposite from the one presented before. This is the unemployment rate. For the unemployment rate, you see the same trends, actually. A port convergence in good time, the crisis arrive, and we have uh, an explosion of differences on member states, and then and now things improve and we are more similar one to each other. If we, if we divide between uh, euro area and non-euro area, we see that uh, euro area is, is red, non-euro area is blue. We see that we were all, all close together uh, in year 2000 uh, with uh, uh, a non-euro area a bit higher than euro area, now is the opposite pictures. So we have uh, a euro area has, uh, in, has, uh, has uh, suffered much more in terms in, 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 in bad times, whereas uh, overall uh, non-euro area has improved their performances. Now, the last group actually, uh, the group where there is uh, more, work, uh, more work to do actually. So, we have a port convergence, but it's not for all the indicators. The upward direction is not uh, everywhere. And uh, uh, so these indicators are those for which uh, uh, Europe is still moving downward, but, uh, but uh, uh, no tangible effect of the crisis was observed. So these uh, negative trends uh, are more or less uh, uh, consolidated, unfortunately. Uh, this is uh, the area of income inequality. Uh, for which actually there is uh, some variability, but uh, especially uh, precarious attachment to labor market, uh, such as uh, uh, undesired form of works, as well as uh, uh, working hours. Now, for these indicators, there is no clear uh, better performance of euro area or non-euro area, uh, or vice versa, actually. Uh, they perform more or less uh, all in the same, in the same way. Uh, here, the income inequality, as, as shown before, uh, it has, it has some, some uh, s cyclical, uh, observ cyclical uh, trend, but uh, it's very strange uh, how it is placed. The, uh, the, 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 um, the level of income inequality decreased uh, till 2013, and then it increased again, and, and then it started to decrease. But uh, as an overall, overall, uh, overall result is that uh, Income inequality among countries increased. So there is, we are more unequal in terms of inequalities now than we were uh, 15 years ago. And then, for example, the share of involuntary part-time. And I presented these indicators, but I could present the share of involuntary temporary work or the uh, transition patterns between uh, temporary contract and permanent contract. They all have the same trends. Here, as we can see, the, the share of uh, people working in an undesired form of work has increased uh, constantly across, across time, as well as uh, the differences among, uh, among the member states. So we have downward divergence here and was more or less observed for the entire, the entire period. So now, so the overall picture, uh, in order to resume the results, we have a large group of indicators for which we have steady and robust 
upward convergence not affected by the business cycle, that by the economic cycle. Another group of indicators for which instability is observed, upward convergence in good time, downward divergence in bad time, they are, not so, they are less than the previous group, but they are key indicators. And then the final group, more work to do in uh, uh, working conditions, uh, income inequality, and so on. So this is the overall picture that emerge, emerge from the data. Now, why, why, I mean, we are here talking about uh, social convergence. I mean, why? It's not just because we like to perform standard deviation and, and coefficient of variations, uh, but because there is an important meeting. I mean, the results, the results show that a port convergence is happening. Uh, is there for most of the indicators, is not uh, or have uh, as we would like in some key indicators. Because uh, the cyclical component of upward convergence in employment and in poverty and the fluctuations around the business cycle are ringing uh, an alarm bells. Uh, because it indicates the importance for member states to strengthen economic and social resilience against future shocks uh, in order to build a sustainable convergence. A convergence path that is not always scrambled uh, as soon as the recession arrives. And then, because the social convergence is important for, for several reasons. I mentioned the broken, the, broken, the broken promise of the citizens, but uh, a poor convergence uh, actually has several implications. Uh, firstly, uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, of course, if we have economic divergence, uh, the shared promise of, of being all, of, of better working and living condition, better, having better working and living condition is broken. But then, if we have also social divergence, social cohesion among members, social cohesion among and within member states, decrease because we are more different. If we don't have social cohesion, we don't have trust because it's a key of cohesion. If we don't have, if, if we don't have trust in institution, we risk to not have a political capital, political consensus for implementing structural reforms that we were talking earlier. So it is true that uh, it is like what uh, was coming from the, the egg of the chicken, actually. But uh, economic convergence, of course, is a driver of living condition and of social convergence. But without social convergence, it's difficult to implement reform in order to be more resilient and convergence and stronger economic and to ensure stronger economic convergence. And then also because. Uh, Social convergence has also, and convergence overall, has, has also cross-national implications that we should, not, uh, we should not forget. If the core is converging, if, if the periphery is diverging, is diverging with growing unemployment rates and growing poverty rates, the export of core countries, for example, will be affected by that, by a decrease of the demand. Moreover, with the higher unemployed in peripheral countries and the higher poverty, mobility from those peripheral member states to core area can be observed with uh, remarkable social implications. Uh, so keeping monitoring convergent trends and implementing policies to avoid future divergence is essential. We have seen, and I'm moving to the conclusion of my speech actually, we have seen uh, that uh, uh, the political guidance, uh, uh, guidelines of the president-elect Ursula von der, uh, von der Leyen advocate for a full implementation of the European pillar of social rights. Uh, we know, actually, but we know that the implementation of the pillar is member state responsibilities, but the EU can support the implement member state in the implementation through the use of legislation, budgetary instrument as cohesion funds, as well as policy, policy coordination. Among the possible, possible options for actions that, that are also listed in the uh, political guidelines of, of the new president-elect, 
the European Employment Reinsurance is measures, is one of the measures that we have also uh, discussed in our report, uh, and uh, it's, it's one of the different options uh, that can work and can be promoted in order to uh, promote macroeconomic risk reduction and at the same time improving uh, uh, convergence of the so socioeconomic conditions, especially for the unemployment, for the unemployed with the, their strengthening their support. And then a fair, fair minimum wage could increase lower wages and could reduce in work poverty and poverty and poverty risk, uh, also reinforcing internal demand. Okay, we have a, there are some studies that shows that this effect uh, can be of not of, not of a big uh, of a big extent, but for sure is important in order to uh, provide a minimum standard for uh, uh, in all the member states. Finally, and this is also uh, at a point that uh, I think is very important, is quality of institutions. It's true that the social dimension is a national responsibility of member states, but it raises expectations about the European Union. Uh, European Union should not be seen as a threat against the national welfare. Uh, it should be seen as a helpful body in order to uh, help citizens to improve working and living condition. In this, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, funds are efficiently invested and efficient investments are done in a transparent way, effective way by, by our institution, national and European, is very important. So, in order to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen that uh, the Great Recession revealed the importance of social convergence. It's not just an economic affair. The two dimensions are pretty linked with an inter interwining uh, uh, effect one to each other. Uh, there is now the general consensus that economically converged are mutually reinforcing and should go hand in hand. And we have seen in the first part of the presentation uh, how this debate developed. Uh, pattern of a poor convergence are recorded in most of uh, uh, the indicators uh, of the European Pillar of Social Rights uh, and other indicators in the employment and socioeconomic dimension. However, the strong cyclical component of uh, many of these indicators ring alarm bells for the sustainability of these trends. And implementing policies to strengthen member states Economic and social resilience is essential in order to avoid the future divergence and uh, to build sustainable convergence. So this was the core of my intervention. Thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, uh, we are doing a lot of work on, on convergence. This is just one of the first, uh, on the first report. But uh, we are investigating all the dimensions also of working condition and living condition. We will see in the future. And these are our projects. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Massey. Frank. Thank you for inviting me. I, was, I for one, was asked uh, not to come with a presentation and to be informal and short, and that's what I try to do, I, to reassure you. First of all, I'd like to say that um, I very much welcome this line of research by Eurofound. I think it's very well taken. It's also well done. There's still a lot of work to do, but it's so far well done. I'm not saying this to flatter you. Um, I really mean it. Um, it's absolutely timely. Uh, it so happened that last week I was in kind of a high-level, closed-door seminar with political theorists and philosophers at the University Institute in, in uh, Firenze, and so the topic was the legitimacy of the EU, and to my surprise, I was not the only one to come up with upward convergence as key to legitimacy. It popped up from several corners. I was a bit surprised by that, positively. There was also some controversy, and to me, that meeting made it clear that it's not sufficient to say upward convergence has a historical pedigree, uh, you should reaffirm it, but you should also be more precise about it. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the merits of the report. It was not in the presentation by Massey, but one of the merits of the report is that, for instance, it makes a distinction between upward convergence, which is basically based on averages, 
and strict upward convergence, which means that no one is left behind, which is, has normatively much more traction. And that distinction is important. I also think that uh, beta convergence is not just, uh, let's say, an empirical observation which you can test, and it's a theory which you can test. Beta convergence has a strong normative traction, because it means that the more you lag behind, the more opportunity you have to catch up. Uh, it, it's a kind of a, a, a dynamic version of the no one is left behind. And so I very much welcome the things you find more in the report than in the presentation, uh, for reasons of time, I guess, that is those distinctions. So what do we exactly mean with upward convergence? Is it just some kind of averages of phenomena? Or is there more that we should define? Obviously, we should uh, also be more precise about the indicators. GDP is admittedly the background condition, but in terms of legitimacy, it's probably the, less, the least important indicator. Huh? Um, and then indeed, disaggregation. Uh, let me say, but I don't want to go into it now, I think non-Eurozone is probably not a very relevant subsample. It's, it's very heterogeneous lot. Eurozone is a, is a relevant subsample for institutional reasons. Non-Eurozone, I think, making the distinction that uh, Plamen made between uh, new entrants and old core is probably more relevant then. Huh? But anyway, I think that the, the really interesting discussion uh, which we had, uh, and I was happy for that, is, is the regional level. Let me explain that. The founding fathers of the European project had basically two axioms in their belief system. The first axiom was that if you integrate markets, you will have upward convergence with some help, but you will have it. And the second axiom in their belief system was that if you integrate markets, you not only have upward convergence between countries, but within the countries, welfare states will be able to, repro to, to redistribute the outcome fairly. This was the second part of their belief system, and they thought you could leave that safely to the national level. Um, we've been, I mean, social policy scholars like me, we've been discussing that second axiom already for many years, and our main worry was, well, if you have competitive pressure on welfare states, you might get phenomena like social dumping and other phenomena. So maybe that simplistic division of labor which the founding fathers had in their mind is, is not, really more, not really more fit for purpose anymore. But the thing we discussed this morning about the regional aspects is another entry into that debate, and is a very fundamental entry into that debate. Suppose, suppose, hypothesis. Suppose it would be the case that today, upward convergence between the countries is based predominantly on a dynamic of agglomeration, then intrinsically, within the countries, you will not have convergence between regions. Hypothesis. Second hypothesis, which Cynthia made, uh, it may be the case that intrinsically, well, the political economy of welfare states has difficulty to cope with that, with left behind regions. It's not sufficient to say we cash out benefits and we fund some, some programs for you. Simply not sufficient. Add to that, the associated phenomenon of mobility, also cross-border mobility and migration and depopulation. And it may be the case that so the, the core aspects of what we see as positive dynamics of upward convergence, like agglomeration effects in countries and migration and depopulation in some areas, it may be the case that our welfare states have real difficulty to cope with that politically, in terms of their political economy. Um, and so that is the reason why I would, I would insist that Cynthia and you uh, further explore this problem, both statistically and conceptually and, and in terms of understanding the economics. Because it really adds to the kind of agenda which people like me have been, uh, let's say, canvassing 
about what should be the division of labor between the EU and the, the, the national member states with regard to social policy, it adds to that something maybe deeply problematic, but not necessarily without solutions. Huh? Um, but so this regional story, I think, is extremely important. Now, obviously, um, it, it's one thing to observe patterns of convergence and then to have more precise definitions and to think about the normative traction of those definitions, like strict versus general, like beta convergence versus upward convergence. So that's one thing. Obviously, the second thing is to think about the kind of policies you need to promote what you want. Uh, and here, I think uh, the work by Massey uh, is, is, is really an interesting contribution because he makes clear that something you might intuitively think is the case, indeed is the case. Intuitively, it, it makes sense to think that if a chain is under stress, it's the weakest parts that suffer most. And so if you have severe economic shocks, if you have instability, you get divergence. So that intuitively it makes sense, but I think you've shown that very well. Uh, and so there is this link between stability and convergence, resilience and convergence, which comes out clearly. I think, and this is the, the last part of what I wanted to say, I think this is not just kind of an empirical observation. It's obviously also policy-wise the real issue. Uh, this link between convergence and stabilization. Why is it policy-wise also the real issue? In a number of documents published by the Commission and other European institutions on stabilization, the idea that we need automatic stabilizers of fiscal capacity, you know that. Huh? It's being repeated often in, in those statements, in those documents, that they can only work if there is a sufficient degree of convergence among the members of the club. So convergence is a kind of a precondition to enhance the stabilization capacity you would like to see at the Eurozone level or the EU level. Obviously, this can become a trap. You can become trapped in this. There is not sufficient convergence, so we cannot organize risk sharing. We are too diverse to organize risk sharing. So you can be trapped into that. I think we should really think very concretely on uh, how we can avoid being trapped into that, but on the contrary, see stabilization mechanisms also as an opportunity to promote convergence in a very concrete sense. And let me just reformulate the case for European-wide or Eurozone-wide unemployment reinsurance as I see it. You compare the notion of having a an adequate domestic stabilization capacity, you compare that notion to being vaccinated, vaccinated against infectious disease. Huh? It's a bit the same thing. You are vaccinated if you have a good stabilization capacity. Now, vaccination, as I explained to my students, is the archetypal example of a good with a positive externality. It's the kind of good you want your neighbor to have because you also benefit, not because you love him, you care for yourself, but you want your neighbor to be well vaccinated. It has a positive externality. What do we do with goods with positive externalities? Either we make them compulsory or we subsidize them or a combination of the two. So this is the story. So you should think about domestic stabilization capacity as a vaccination program. And so partly it is saying to every, every member of the club, look, in this club, contagion is a risk. Infection is a risk. You should be well vaccinated. What are we talking about? We are talking about adequate unemployment insurance, full coverage of the working population, not segmented, which means also obviously that working should ensure access to adequate social protection for everybody in order to have that kind of stabilization properties. It follows immediately. Sufficiently generous levels, obviously, notably for the short term. And then, obviously, a policymaker like me says, well, but you have also then, you need also good activation policies to have the balance between sufficiently generous benefits, which are stabilizers if they are sufficiently 
universal and active. So you, so you develop policy principles on which you might, you might want to see some convergence for reasons of good vaccination everywhere, but you would also support it, and you would support it by European unemployment reinsurance. And so there the argument, I think, should be that such, a, such an approach, stabilization via European unemployment insurance, would both benefit from convergence, but also contribute to convergence. And it's this kind of virtuous circle, so not being trapped, but trying to reason in terms of a virtuous circle between the two that you need to get off the ground. Um, let me end, I see I have to end, just one thing, I was obviously happy that you, you refer to, to one of my publications, we are always very happy with that, but, but, but that's not the point. You spotted, you spotted, I don't, we did not talk about this, eh? but you spotted very well the key message, the key message of the uh, attitude survey experiment we did in 13 countries about unemployment insurance. The key message is the following. What exercises the people, the respondents, is not what exercises us policymakers most. We, since you know, so in the SEPS project, we are very much exercised by how can we avoid permanent transfers? How can it be pure actuarially neutral insurance? And that is important, eh? politically and policy-wise. And we like to play with models to see how can we do that? The respondents in the survey, 20,000 people, are not so exercised by that. Whether there is more or less redistribution ongoing is not very important. Important is the conditions of activation and education which you attach to the scheme. That is important for legitimacy. So it's, let's say, the moral element. Huh? So is it efficient? Will they also educate those people? Will they train those people? if we spend our money somewhere else? Huh? And will there be some requirements in terms of job search? In a reasonable way. And you quote that, you, and I think that is indeed the key, key, key conclusion. We are still working on it. We will publish um, a, new, a new paper which really goes into that. But it's a key conclusion. Uh, and it means indeed that uh, the thinking about stabilization is not just a technocratic thinking, it's a thinking that needs thinking on convergence, and it connects also with issues of legitimacy and public support in a very tangible sense, I would say. That's what I wanted to say. Sorry to be nevertheless a bit long. Thank you very much indeed, Frank. Uh, that was really, really wonderful. Uh, and Massey as well. Uh, questions, uh, comments from the floor? So, employment, unemployment, uh, poverty, I think, um, are those who basically have a cyclical component. Now, these are indicators which are cyclical, right? Now, I'm, I'm, my point is uh, what it means that we have uh, um, convergence which is uh, not stable. So, let, let me give you an example. So, the fact that you have uh, divergence in unemployment rates in times of, of crisis, to some extent, is, is natural. Now, what is behind is because countries uh, um, are going through different kind of, of cycles because they respond differently in terms of quantity prices or um, unemployment wages adjustment. W what is behind? I'm, I'm really wondering what is, what is behind. Um, the behavior of that indicator. Further, um, well, while you're good man, good man. Well, if nobody else takes yeah. the floor. 
No, uh, thank you very much, Mas Massimiliano. I think it's very interesting work, uh, and I agree with Frank. Uh, some of the most interesting parts you, you didn't present on, on clarifying the concept of uh, convergence and the different layers. Uh, so that's really very en enlightening, I think. So thank you for that. I have a practical, more practical comment. Uh, and that's on the uh, indica one of the indicators you use, which is, uh, as uh, following your research, more cyclical, that's the arrow pay. And I might have made this remark on another occasion, but I I'm not sure, but I make it any anyway again, because I think it's not without importance. The arrow pay is a composite indicator consisting of three indicators, the at-risk of poverty rate, income poverty, so uh, material deprivation and quasi-joblessness. Now, I think uh, these three indicators reflect very different dimensions, and I think you might come to different conclusions if you would look at the, these three subcomponents uh, in relation to the uh, synthetic measure. So I, I think it would be interesting to accompany the Arab analysis of the AROPE with the three uh, constituent indicators. Okay. Um. Both those questions were quite technical and tricky. I'll try and uh, get this at another question to give Massey time to think about it. <laughs> uh, nope, Massey, I tried. <laughs> Ruth. It's not really a question. I'm sorry, it's always the same people speaking. Um, it's, it's linked actually to the presentation also before of, um, and the famous trigram. Uh, and indeed, I, th I think the, uh, the, the issue of um, um, a stabilization mechanism is not only... Uh, so what I was missing from that diagram is that stabilization can also... Is, is, I mean, the, how can I say? The good living conditions, from his diagram, huh? the good living conditions can also have a positive effect on stabilization. And uh, so that builds back on the dis discussion on, uh, on uh, um, stabilization function. I'm sorry I haven't been very clear, but uh, the, the, what I'm trying to say, so the issue, what you were discussing about the stabilization function is, is not only that per se can create a virtuous circle in the sense of improving the, um, uh, in the sense of, of you know, improving, let's say, the activation measures in member states and the way unemployment insurance is organized at national level, but it can also, in fact, smooth out the cyclical indicators mm. uh, and therefore itself have a stability, yeah, exactly. you know, yeah. as a, a, a virtuous route also at the macro level. So, mm. in short, I will not make such a big separation between the macro and the micro. The panelists like to respond? Uh, Yes, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can start. Uh, yeah, thanks for all the comments, actually. Uh, well, yes, we have done some work in, uh, in uh, studying and uh, try to disentangle the complexity of upward convergence. And uh, in this presentation, I tried to focus more on the results. But uh, uh, yes, also, as, uh, as, uh, as Frank or, or you pointed out, uh, yes, the thing of a strict upward convergence when we all improve, actually, and not just on average improve. I think is uh, I think is was was a part of the of the methodological study that we did that I really found interesting. Uh, why I didn't I didn't present the result actually uh, because uh, strict upward convergence. So when we improve uh, all uh, during the period of time of the investigation that I presented never happened. No, it's not true that never happened. I studied 21 indicators, it happened just for one indicator. And these are uh, the share of tertiary, uh, sorry, the share of people with tertiary attainment. For that indicators, we consider all the, the, all the data series, yes, we all improved. Uh, some improved very little, uh, our country. Uh, others improved a lot. But that is the only indicator. Then we have a strict upward convergence uh, in some periods, for example, employment rate, we all improved uh, since 2014. Uh, unemployment rate, the same more or less. But uh, otherwise, in the long term, uh, it never happens, just for this uh, tertiary, tertiary education. But yes, I think it's very important because uh, uh, it's like uh, 
has everything as any, anyone left behind as 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 you said uh, uh, frank and this is a, may may be helpful uh, to to answer actually because uh, under the world of poor convergence uh, some uh, uh, situation of members that do not increase remain remain hidden under the one indicator of average uh, so uh, then in terms of aropi yes we have presented here ROPI. It's the only indicator related to poverty that I presented part of this, of this study uh, together with material deprivation. But uh, uh, this because uh, uh, we are producing a thematic reports on upward convergence in the four areas that I presented earlier, which is employment, socioeconomic, working condition, and living condition. In the one of living condition that we have started now, we will investigate all the different uh, uh, components of the ROPI uh, in order to provide a full picture on uh, material deprivation and what happens in material deprivation and to have more answer to that. Uh, finally, the one uh, on cyclical. Yes, it is true. Uh, these indicators, employment and poverty, they are cyclical, but they are cyclical in levels, uh, usually in literature. What we found is that they are cyclical also in variability. So what, what does it mean? Does it mean uh, that uh, uh, countries that are um, at, the, at the back of the chain, as, as you mentioned, they basically have experienced much more volatility. Uh, for example, some countries in the indicators of needs, uh, uh, they decrease the needs uh, strongly before the crisis. Then as soon as the crisis arrived, all of these decreases just, just went down. So the volatility was huge. Uh, what does it mean? There are drivers that need to be studied in order to answer better here, but for sure is that the convergent process was not sustainable. And so we need to work on this sustainability. Just a brief comment, Frank, uh, yourself? Yeah, brief, um, if you, if you may. very brief. So m my argument was not that you should have made a pre presentation in terms of strict upward convergence, because obviously there would have been quasi-nothing. But I think it was worth exploring um, the following idea and it's worth exploring, to what extent do we deviate from the ideal of strict upward convergence? And then, technically speaking, conceptually, beta convergence is a kind of a fuzzy and a soft dynamic version yes. of that. Yeah? Uh, on route, yes, uh, you spotted very well. In fact, I had noted that I had to say that and I did not say it, which is a mistake. <laughs> um, indeed, the, the, the virtuous circle, you might want to launch yeah, between convergence and stabilization is both the macro impact, yeah, there is a macro virtual circle, and the thing I emphasize that in order to have those mechanisms work, you need on the ground, on a more micro or meso level, you need policies of social convergence yeah, on, on general lines. It's indeed the two. Uh, but I think we should try to develop that argument and make it understandable and attractive. Just one uh, reflection for myself, and that is that uh, you know, both in the previous sessions and uh, in, in our work, uh, comments from yourself, Frank, uh, and from, from the floor, this regional perspective is becoming more and more, uh, yeah, more and more important. And I think that uh, it's also important, very, very, uh, very, it's very important politically as well. Yeah. It, it's, it's quite hard, actually, to account in some ways for the discontent in our, in our societies from measures of individual uh, material uh, deprivation or whatever. You know, we, we have now full employment. Unemployment is low. Uh, unemployment, however, is a measure that affects one person. Poverty is a measure inequality. It's a measure that affects a household. But when you start to have deprivation, disadvantage and so on concentrated in uh, regional areas, I think this sort of multiplies mm -hmm. a sense of discontent. Not only am I unemployed, my brother in the next street is now unemployed, my neighbours are unemployed, my region is doomed. You know, this, this type of uh, uh, mentality that can be quite difficult to pick up in these individual or family-based indicators, I think is very important uh, from a political perspective to understand a lot of the political things, uh, unpleasant political things that are happening in our societies. I'm very glad that we have a director from uh, Regio uh, in the panel after the break. Before we break for coffee, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Dragos uh, Pislaru, 
uh, who will give a perspective from the European Parliament, and uh, he's very well qualified to do so, if I may say. He has an extensive uh, academic uh, experience and knowledge, and also uh, a very high level uh, political uh, experience. Uh, you are currently a MEP with Renew, and uh, look very much forward to uh, your remarks, which roughly 15 minutes, if yes. you would. Thank, um, you. thank you very much. Uh, for me, it's, it's a very relevant experience because I used to be actually, you know, more or less on the evidence-based policy, you know, advising other people, researching before, and right now I'm actually um, in a position as a politician, rather a new politician, to actually use that evidence for the benefit of citizens. So thank you very much for the invite. Um, I hope to bring a perspective that it's uh, more like citizen-centered. Clearly there are three things that I'm following in this legislature, to be, have a citizen-centered perspective, to be forward-looking, so to look actually at what's coming, not what happened, yeah? And obviously um, what is, I think, very important to have an evidence-based policy. So thank you, Eurofund and the Commission for you know, uh, organizing that. Now, um, the timing and the context for our debate is, is, is remarkable. We are right now in the Parliament before the hearings of the commissioners, and we are looking at um, what uh, President-elect Ursula von der Leyen has actually you know, put forward. And uh, it was you know, well said, it says, as a, as a priority, the reconciliation of the social and the market in today's modern economy, which is exactly what we're talking here about, um, which is um, obviously uh, very often in a political sphere, uh, you know, put under, under storm from ideological perspectives, but I think that we are talking here about things that are, you know, the realities of, of nowadays. Now, obviously, we are talking from an economic perspective of the, e at the EMU, at the Budgetary Instrument for Convergence, which has already been referred here, and we are talking at the full implementation of the European uh, Pillar of Social Rights. Uh, what does it mean exactly? How full is full? That's something that we need to define. I mean, this is a work that uh, has been uh, pioneered in the last couple of years, and it's no, right now we don't have enough clarity where the process will do, but it's clearly related to social convergence, let's put it this way. Yeah. Now, um, the presentations were really relevant. I'm actually, I'm a member of both the employment um, committee, where I'm actually a coordinator from Renew, and on the econ as well. So, and on ITRE as, uh, as a substance. So I have this, this triad of economic, <laughs> I'm a reflection, an embodiment of the work in the parliament on economic and social convergence. And, and I do believe that for us at least, uh, we, I mean, you know, no pressure, we, did, we do need to make it happen, as was suggested in the title. So you are providing the evidence, but we are supposed to actually deliver it together with the commission, obviously. Um, now, um, I mean, the first thing is what do we measure? I mean, so we are talking about convergence, and we've seen a lot of measurements and data and so on. So the question is, what do we measure? And here we do have two strands. You know, have the mainstream strand related to GDP and income and things like that a more hardcore to the economic thinking. And then you have this you know, philosophical thing that is going up and down related to happiness and well-being. We see in the Finnish presidency bringing the economic well-being as one of the important dimensions. Um, and it's actually very important you know, that you know, all the people probably realize that, but you can play with data as it suits. So even the factual part, I mean, the way in which you present it, the data series that you select even the, I mean, I was looking at the, uh, at the growth rates in the first presentations. I mean, if you are starting with a very low baseline, like, you know, Eastern Europe, for instance, I mean, of course, your growth rates would be, you know, skyrocketing. But in the end, it doesn't mean that much. I mean, to go from, you know, really, really, really low, 100% more, it's still really low. You know? so, so I think that, that we should actually be looking at factual data with, with, with cautious and then, obviously, factual data is one thing, but the citizens are not necessarily all of them, you know, looking at uh, SEPs reports and so on, although I recommend that highly. Uh, the idea is that citizens are having perceptions, and that's something that bothers us politicians. Um, they may not, you know, be even aware that from an average perspective, their country or their region is better, if they feel that it's not better. And then I dare you to go there and contradict them because you have elections and then, you know, you know, we see Brexit and we see Italy, we see Poland, we see Hungary. And then what I'm trying to say is that, and this is one of the most important things that I want to, you know, put forward in the debate, 
is that there is a direct link in between economic and social convergence and the political reality. So if we don't look at that and we don't understand that this is not just you know, something to observe as a social scientist, but something that is going to affect our democracies and is going to affect even the foundations of the European Union if we are not taking care of it, and, and we, we do have a problem. Now, I mean, obviously, um, there, is, there is a reinventing the wheel a little bit here and there. Um, from an economic perspective, I'm delighted to see how, for instance, Mandel's theory is actually brought uh, over and over um, in the case of Europe and the Euro area. Yeah. So Mandel is basically you know, putting together you know, some principles and requirements for the optimum currency areas, and there was a harsh debate during the Euro adoption and still going on. We had this morning the discussion about the business cycle, which is kind of important. We have been talking about the risk insurance, you know, um, which is kind of important as well. But then we are you know, facing things of a social nature, for, for instance, labor mobility. And from a parliament perspective, it's kind of interesting to look at the labor mobility uh, developments um, and to see that we are not necessarily you know, pushing for more labor mobility, which implies, by the way, what we are trying to do right now with the 883 regulation, which is said by Mandel very clearly, you know, kind of ages ago, that it's about moving freely the social contributions and pensions and so on. So we are right now rediscovering what would have been you know, the, the base for that. And I hope, being a shadow rapporteur on the 83, to be able to deliver on that as fast as possible. And this is social convergence, somehow. I mean, this is linked to social convergence. Now, also, the labor mobility um, brings us to notions that are, you know, from an economic perspective, not very clear uh, or well fundamented, like social dumping, which may be argued or may be just an excuse for nationalistic policies. And here, I mean, Danny Roderick has been writing an article, an opinion, in uh, New Europe. I don't know if you've yeah. seen it. It was very powerful. It said, I mean, income gap. I mean, right now, if we are looking at the income gap in between you know, uh, uh, the different countries in the world, we see that basically the differential of income in one country can actually be larger than the differential of income in between countries. So the problem that we are facing right now is that we have the inclination in the member states, I'm talking here from a political perspective, to look more at social converge, economic and social convergence in our own country and more or less see that as against the economic and social convergence of the Europe as, as a whole. And I don't think that this is only an east-west divide. This is not a north-south divide. This is a much more complex thing if you look at you know, the argument that has been well put here from the new economic geography perspective, Krugman, and so on, which, by the way, we realized, you know, in Lisbon quite some years ago. Sure. I mean, the whole thing about territorial cohesion, which has been adopted as a goal of the European Union, was the realization that we need, you know, to work on these concepts. And we have not done that much. Evidence gathering? Yes. You know, more or less seeing best practices of functional areas and how it's operate? Yes. Decisive action in how to deal with that? Not necessarily, or seldom. Now, um, one of the things that um, it's really important for me um, as, as a member of the European Parliament is we need to you know, ask ourselves, why do, why do we need social convergence? And you know, there are some, some people that are arguing for social convergence from a rights perspective. That is, we need to take care of the deprived, you know, to ensure rights for the children and so on. But as an economist, I actually see it also, you know, from a gain argument. We are all going to gain on that. And here comes the second thing that I wanted to build upon. I see social convergence as a revamped notion of how to invest the best into a better economic development. There is evidence today suggesting that investing in early education or prevention in health and so on is providing multiples that are by far higher than any brick and mortar investment that you can pick and choose. And for me, it's bewildering actually to see why we can't treat this as investment and put it in the budget as investment and we are treating it still as expenditure. As a Minister of Labor in Romania, I was actually dealing with the Ministry of Finance all the time, asking for more resources for the care industry and you know, you know, giving access and opportunities for the citizens. 
And again, this was, you know, a no-go policy. This is expenditure. We can't increase expenditure. We have budget deficits, and this is about nominal convergence, and we should keep to that. And then I try to explain that we have multiples that go from 7 to 14. That is the seven times the amount that you put, yeah? To just be very clear. I mean, if you invest money in there. And for me, I mean, I, I really don't understand why can't we, because we are talking about economic and social convergence, why can't we focus on this kind of impact investment? Commissioner Katainen has done already a good thing with that. InvestEU is right now focusing on that, and I'm going to be a shadow rapporteur on that one as well, so we are probably meet on that one as well. But I do believe that economists and business people alike need to understand that investing in social things is not for mercy. It's for, for, for their gain. They gain as well. So these kind of arguments, I think, at political level need to be put. Now, um, I'm going to, oh, oh, and obviously, here, the, the whole thing, um, I mean, it, the Lucas paradox has been touched here with the you know, um, diminishing returns on capital and so on. We are talking about the revamped Lucas paradox right now. And part of it is actually due to, to decreased labor mobility. I just wanted to make that point. And I think that there are ideas that, again, are reinvented and put together. So right now, indeed, because of technology and these mega trends, we are talking about the revamped Lucas paradox. And things are not going to be sort, uh, sorted without actually either removing barriers or doing some investment in you know, the things that we are really uh, actually into in terms of the social convenience. I mean, how to do it, and this is obviously, I'm not going to bring you the, you know, Polishinal uh, secret right now, and you know we can go home. Uh, this is something that we need to, to work on. But what I do believe is that, um, well, I mean, there was a triangle with structural reforms, and we all know about structural reforms. But the triangle was efficiency, sustainability, and fairness. We know how to measure efficiency. We know how to measure sustainability. We don't have too many clues on how to measure fairness. And it is about this subjectiveness of fairness that we need to address. And again, this is actually at the core of what I call the citizen-centered approach of what we need to do. And then it is clear right now that volatility is one of the most important things that we have. And statisticians and researchers hate volatility. We need to witness that you know, and, uh, and to confess that. And, and what we need right now is agility in reaction and how we can increase our agility in reaction by going back to the citizens. I mean, if we understand the microcosm of a family in a particular vulnerable region that may involve both you know, issues related to unemployment, but also to access to education, to health care, to housing, to nutrition, then we may have a better picture of how it is. Because right now, the social convergence is very, very often you know, put in terms of money allocation in relation directly with jobs. And it's not only about jobs. And here I'm going again to, the, to the, that kind of impact investment argument. Now, yes, we need a European semester that will focus more on, on the social agenda. Maybe even talk about the social mastery criteria. Why not? Or why not you know, going beyond the nominal criteria and add some social criteria, so not just monitoring it and so on. And it is about financial resources, but it's not about redistribution. And you know, making some people believe that some, some of their money is used for other people's money with no purpose. In the end, I will end with the pledge to actually understand that we are not talking here only about aggregates or about statistics. We are talking about children that are deprived, and we are having about 24 million children that are deprived right now in Europe. Now, for their families and for them, this kind of discussion is very abstract. So the whole thing that we have on package right now with the child guarantee and with the guarantee as a concept, not necessarily by redistributing, but giving them access and investing in the future, I think that is the most meaningful reform that we can actually do towards economic and social convergence. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much indeed. And, th and thank you very much Billy, for highlighting the, this uh, social uh, investment perspective that is all too seldom, I think, uh, related to, um, uh, to the convergence debate. And indeed, social uh, investment mm -hmm. is not too much um, mm -hmm. spoken about uh, generally. We have time for a few very, very brief uh, comments or questions to um, Dragos, uh, if there's any. Everybody wants a cup of coffee. Uh, and yeah. Dragos, I hope, will be joining us for coffee and perhaps yeah. we can continue the discussion uh, then. Uh, Sincere. Okay. Okay. Thank you. One question. You mentioned that um, you 
mentioned mobility mm -hmm. and the, the, the reference to Mandel. So that, that was one of the key elements of uh, stabilization of, um, um, within a monetary union. <clears throat> and now we have reached a point uh, where for some countries uh, actually mobility is, uh, is an issue. Mm -hmm. It is actually, uh, especially for sending countries, I mean this is uh, particularly relevant for, for Romania, but actually also for Italy, mm -hmm. uh, where you have uh, people living and you have uh, loss of uh, human capital, uh, that's, that's an issue, especially if you have uh, highly educated people uh, living. But also the, the fact that those who are living tend to be the more entrepreneurial uh, and that the more open to, 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 to change. And one of the fundamental questions is, is again, how to, how to square these, uh, these mechanisms. Mm -hmm. which uh, on the one end should, should bring uh, stabilization, on the other end uh, may uh, reduce growth. This is actually also linked to what Ruth say, said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and here, I actually, I do, I do not have um, um, a question. Um, but, uh, yeah. Okay, I, I will An answer. Sure. Yeah, sure. sure. So Please. there are two ways of looking at that, the vicious circle and the virtuous circle. It depends on how do you want to tackle it, and you know that economics and social sciences are about self-fulfilling prophecies, yeah? So if you are going to look at it from the vicious circle perspective, you will feel the need to intervene and interfere and limit mobility. And then that, in my view, is going to cause even you know, worse evil. If you are looking for the virtuous circle perspective, then you are going to see the good part of it and you are going to try to see how we can improve you know, or reduce the, or mitigate the negative effects. And let me explain, just not to be very abstract. You have the brain drain phenomenon, yeah? And that's harming a lot of countries because they are investing in the education and they are losing people and sometimes the best people and so on. But on the other hand, it is in the literature, I think for 30 years or so, what is called the reverse brain drain phenomenon. And the fact that some of the people that are going are getting the knowledge and the know-how and then they are coming back to their countries and invest and coming back with all the kind of, you know, plethora of knowledge and, and skills that they have. Now, obviously, if you feel that this is not going to, you know, right now, factually, that is rather brain drain than rather reverse brain drain, then you may have policies to stimulate that. On the other hand, the whole, I mean, and this is related to the origin countries, but if you look at the host countries right now, I feel that sometimes they are actually telling the origin countries that they have a problem with because too many people are leaving, so they should actually do something to stop their people. But in fact, some of the politicians and in the destination countries are more or less looking at their own constituencies and the fact that somehow they are still instilling the fear in their own constituencies that they are losing the jobs and so on and so forth. Whereas the evidence suggests that those jobs are actually you know, vacant because people are not taking them on board. Brexit is to a large extent this kind of political instilling of fear into the UK that we are going to invade them. And I mean, this is how perception is transforming reality. So what I'm trying to say, it depends on us, and especially, of course, uh, as a member of the European Parliament, it, it's, it's my task, uh, foremost task, to, to talk to people, to understand how they view things, and to try not to you know, go in a, in a vicious circle and a path of dependency towards the fact that we need to curve this kind of bad phenomenon. You know, so that would be my response. And, you know, the things are unfolding. So it depends on you and on us on, you know, how to be, you know, wise enough to, to respond to that. Thank I you. think that's a very positive conclusion yeah, to uh, this morning's session. <laughs> uh, thank you all uh, very much indeed. Let's have some coffee. Thank <clears> you. <throat> thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat>